gentlemen, <laughs> this is what it's all about. It's, we're going to talk about networks and coalition building. It's happening in front of our very eyes here, ladies and gentlemen. But we do need to get started because I want to make sure, I know many of you have travel plans, so I want to make sure that we end uh, this closing plenary of the main event uh, in good times. Um, we've talked a lot ever since the start of this conference yesterday about, to use the words Johan Hoekstrom used, holding hands. Somebody in our panel yesterday, I think it was Gail uh, Whiteman, talked about building rapid response teams, given the urgency of the issue. We heard in our last session about the importance of communities, about the importance of institutions, and this sign of hope that Dirk Messner talked about with the growth of transnational networks and alliances. And what the key principles are that underpin that cooperation, that make it work. All issues where I hope we'll come back to in our panel in a moment. So we're going to have a panel discussing global alliances that will help us to downscale from the concept to its operationalization at European, regional level, at national level, and at local level, as we talked, and among all the different actors in the private sector, civil society organizations, as well as policymakers. How do we get them to work together in coalitions, in teams? Then after that, uh, we're going to hear from a small team of people who have been developing a roadmap, some key elements for a roadmap for where we go from here. We have been seeking throughout the two days concrete ideas for the key next steps. I've been putting our panels on the spot. Drawing on that and on their deliberations, they will present to us very briefly what they see as some key elements for the roadmap. Uh, and then we will end uh, with a keynote speech by the Parliamentary State Secretary, Rita Schwarzelier Sutter. Uh, and then there will be lunch, and then for some of you, there is a side event afterwards. I'll tell you more about that later. So, next steps for mainstreaming. We talked about the opportunities for mainstreaming in the last session. Now we turn to the next steps. What are we going to do? Let me bring back Professor Dr. Dirk Messner, Director of the German Development Institute. Where are you, Dirk? Please do come and join me. And also bring back Dr. Heinrich Buttermann, General Secretary of the German Federal Environment Foundation. Joining us for the first time, Dagmar Dehmer, who is a journalist at the Tagesspiegel, and Katinka Adenbrook, Head of One Planet Thinking at W. WWF, and Dr. Moritz Neal, head of the Berlin offices of Sustain, a CSR consultancy. So a very warm welcome to you all. Make yourselves comfortable. I always like a panel who are polite and introduce themselves to each other. Um, and the way this is going to work, ladies and gentlemen, is we're going to dive straight in. I've asked our panel not to make any opening remarks. I'm going to ask a question to the people we haven't heard from first, uh, and then I'll get Dirk and Heinrich to react. I will then ask them a few more questions, and then I will come out to all of you. And I would say this is your last opportunity at this event uh, to comment on what you've been hearing, as well as to put your questions. So please don't be shy uh, or or, as we say in English, backwards in coming forwards. It would be great to hear from as many of you as possible in this last session. Um, so, let us dive straight in, and we're talking about the title of this session, Building a Global Alliance for a Sustainable Anthropocene, Making Use of Safe Operating Space Opportunities. Um, let me dive in, and Moritz, as you're sitting next to me, let me start with you. Um, from a private sector perspective, how important do you believe it is to build these new alliances and networks, and how are we doing? How well are policymakers, the private sector, civil society working together now? There's handheld mics in front of you. Yeah, thanks a lot for this opportunity for me to sit here. I just want to know that I'm a CSR consultant, so I'm very close to companies, but I'm not working for a normal manufacturing company, so I can all, only give you um, some insights which I gathered from my project experience with companies. But I think this is um, quite expansive. You hold so, the mic up a little bit, that's and so, um, yeah, I think for companies, as far as I got experience too, this subject is pretty new and it's also yeah, competing with other issues like SDGs, like GRIG4, like um, ecosystem valuation, etc. And companies are struggling with the complexity of their supply chains. So they even don't know what's happening beyond their direct suppliers. And but we know from scientific 
analysis that for most companies the major impacts are in the far advanced, um, far um, remote supply chain somewhere, not in the direct um, um, premises within the companies. And as long as they don't understand what's happening in their supply chains, up and downstream, it is really hard for them to know what is happening, mm. where are the hotspots, where to focus. And, but bearing in mind that the major part of the impacts are in the supply chains, many, many uh, yeah, suppliers are um, involved in those supply chains. And this means companies cannot work on their own. They need to have collaborations with others they need to join forces in order to be able to work on these issues. And how good are they now at doing that? Um, they are <laughs> at the very beginning. They start right now understanding a bit about what's happening in the supply chains. Some of them have some knowledge on yeah, carbon emissions, but all these other issues which you showed in the graphs today and yesterday, um, from my experience, it is really hard for them okay. to generate enough understanding yeah. Thank you. And we'll come back perhaps to how other groups uh, can help with that process a little bit later on. But Katinka, from a civil society perspective, uh, One Planet Thinking, of course, has put this idea. Uh, this is an, actually an example of civil society operationalizing the idea. Um, in terms of these alliances and working together, I think in One Planet Thinking, who do you work with on these ideas? How effective is that cooperation? How important is it? So thank you for this opportunity to discuss uh, what we are doing as a civil society at WWF, but not only at WWF. We work together, for example, in the Netherlands with IUCN. Um, we are a program which wants to make the planetary boundaries in practice for companies, financial institutes and rating agents and governments. So we really want to make the translation between what's happening on Earth mm -hmm. and all the clever people thinking about and investigating in the science departments. <laughs> and um, this is a really a big thing to do. It's, it's something you cannot do on your own, clearly. And uh, that is why we are starting with cooperations with other NGOs, because it's not a cherry picking of companies. So let's do this NGO. If you cannot do it there, let's do it there. We want to be a normative front, what we think is the minimal requirements. And the minimal requirements is living inside the planetary boundaries. We cannot go on like we do at this moment. So we are looking actively um, for, for partnerships, other NGOs, Stockholm Resilience Center, for example, for uh, science, but also other scientifics. We work with governments like uh, the Swiss government, the uh, Dutch government, uh, and we are looking forward to work further with the German government, but also in India we are approaching the government. I would not say work together yet, but there is an idea on that. And um, there we have also, we work together on ethical issues because that is a big thing, it's more or less the elephant in the room at this moment, what is the ethical discussion around how we divide uh, our operating space, our free operating space, and we are not doing the ethical discussion in our own groups, we are only stimulating ethical discussion, for example, with the group of Rome. Okay, so working a lot with the, the NGOs, but also with these other partners is very much part of, of the approach. Uh, and Dirk said earlier, without, uh, or no, I think it was Walter said, there are no messages without messengers. That translation role, I'm interested you, you describe it as that. Why do you describe it as that? Yeah, so um, I heard a lot about uh, communication, but I thought still it was approached about how we think in our brain. But this is also a lot about the emotion. And if we don't touch the consumer on the emotional side, it will be not a, it's not a message. It is too intellectual. And we are sitting here with a clever group of people, but the emotion is where people react on. And as WWF, we do that deliberately uh, via communication animals, and nature, people are uh, uh, catched in the heart. We in the Netherlands have a million consumer supporting us, which is a huge platform, and uh, that is where we, how we reach out. And we do three things with consumers. We inform them, we educate, and we give them other choices. 
So we don't make them like really, oh, I'm in panic now and what to do. Then there is always the choice. You can do little steps, make better. And further, we work with companies. And the companies want to implement one plan of thinking. And they want also to communicate that to the consumers. So we use these two platforms on communication. Thank you. When it comes to talking to the public, Dagmar, uh, it's the journalists, and I say we because I am a, a journalist by training uh, and still do some, but for you, we haven't talked so much about the role of the media in all of this. Uh, we have, and, and uh, Johan showed us a slide yesterday, some of the cuttings. It is out there, um, but uh, well, to described earlier, communications gap, that beyond the scientific world, there aren't that many people who know a lot about it. How do you see the challenge and how do you see the role of the media within this, if I can describe you as a panel, uh, as a, a, a network, how do you see your role as an actor in all of this? Mm, the media cannot be part of the network. They have to stand beside the network and watch it. Because uh, we have a, a huge problem with uh, credibility um, what Dirk was already touching on in the talk before, um, there's no trust in the media because the media are seen as part of an elite project which is giving people no choices or make them helpless or um, govern above them or beside them, but definitely not with them. And um, for the media, especially in Germany, because of our past, and <laughs> we have a, a horrible media history too, <laughs> um, we, people are extremely sensitive when they feel that they have a campaign journalism before them. So we have to stay outside and play our part in a different way. Mm. And we have the problem um, that in the media system, which is eroding completely, economically and um, well I work for a, a dinosaur a print paper <laughs> um, that means technically too and um, the young people just do not read papers except they live in a household of journalists who still read papers but otherwise they don't <laughs> and probably never will um, so we are living in a complete changing environment and reach less and less people. Mm. And um, that makes it even harder to communicate issues like planetary boundaries. I mean, yesterday when I came into my office and told my colleagues I should write a piece about planetary boundaries, they said, about what? Mm. And what are you talking about? And is it any different to the Club of Rome 20 or 30 years ago? Is there something new? And of course, these are legitimate questions and I have to try to answer them. I think the concept is in a way good for communication because you have that graph which shows you the connections between all the spheres that make our lives and our planet. But on the other hand, it is um, a graph that makes you extremely helpless and people hate something very much and that is helplessness so in communicating you may not uh, tell them we are doomed or doomed or or how do you go in a superlative of doomed um, you are in a trap which you cannot escape Okay, and it was very interesting yesterday, I think it was one of the slides in, in Johan's presentation where he said there was a headline saying, Earth is 44% doomed, which as you say, I thought it was marvelous, that's so that you could increase the doom level later on, but I thought, how do you calculate 40, and he said it was something like you simply take the boundaries and divide, uh, I, I couldn't quite work it out. Um, Heinrich, if I could come to you, and you talked right at the beginning of your speech this morning about the importance of alliances, to, and you put it, to carve out opportunities. Um, how well are we doing? I mean, Dirk seemed quite optimistic about the alliances, not the traditional ones, multi-government, multi-level governance and so on, but these transnational networks. How well are we doing in terms of building alliances? How do you see the state of play now? Yes, I think uh, it's... Uh first step we have to do to use to, to look for alliances with companies with all the governments I think it is a most important role the government will have 
uh, to accept uh, the system of the planetary boundaries because then they have to accept the scientific ideas and the scientific results. And so the alliances from communities, from uh, um, 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 from co companies uh, and they should accept that they have a responsibility uh, that they have uh, to accept uh, that there are bo uh, boundaries and uh, many of the, our companies don't accept it so I told it this morning because uh, they uh, don't realize that we have uh, a, a small earth and they cannot produce in any way. And it was very, very interesting, as Karin Niebert uh, uh, showed us, there are several products we don't use. And so the companies have to reflect their own future, and so uh, they have to accept the boundaries, and so in this point, all partners have to accept this situation and put it in their own DNA and then uh, there are, uh, I think, solutions and cooperations uh, possible and necessary to find uh, a final uh, solution for this problem. Okay. Dirk, um, from your point of view, just when, on this point that, that uh, Moritz made at the beginning about there are lots of what he called competing sets of concepts uh, and they're struggling to get their heads around. Should we be wary of, of creating a competition between planetary boundary concepts and, and other concepts? Is there a way of making this easier for companies, cutting through the confusion? And if I could ask just now, if we can move on now to how you see the different roles of the different actors, because you talked about cooperation, how important it is, but who needs to do what? So the role of civil society, the role of the media, would you share Dagmar's view? She can't be part of this. She has to stand aside and report on it. How do you see the roles of the different players? Okay, so Moritz, Moritz's point first. Uh, my impression is that the, the concept, many people don't know the concept still, no? but my uh, impression is communicating the concept. When I communicate the concept, it's relatively easy to explain to people what is at risk actually. No? So the planetary boundaries and then the tipping point is something which many people understand immediately. Many people do not understand immediately what, uh, what we have been listening about, all these chemicals, 1,000 and different substances, etc., etc. So this is all very complex, but it comes together in this uh, uh, easy narrative actually no, of planetary boundaries which we need to accept to avoid tipping points which will damage future generations. So in, in two sentences you can explain what you are, what you are talking about. Mm. No? And narratives are very important. This has been your point also. Narratives are important to communicate and to make people aware. And my perception is that this, can, this narrative can people make aware. I'm, it's much more difficult to communicate the 2030 agenda. We had a panel on that, Heinrich, no? some weeks ago. And communicating to people 17 goals <laughs> is more difficult than communicating the basic concept of the planetary boundaries. No? So I find it, uh, I think it's easy to communicate. This is point one. Point number, point number two, if you allow me mm. to say, I think that we have to do uh, three very important things. The first is that we need to tell success stories. Companies can do that, NGOs can do that, uh, we as scientists can do that, political decision makers can do that, because if you, if you make people scared, this is what you said, no? you paralyze activities, but we would like to mobilize activities, so tell success stories. For example, 90% no? of energy investments in Europe in 2016 has been renewables. No? If, what, if someone would have argued only five years ago, not to talk about 10 years ago, that 90% of uh, energy investments in Europe would be renewable in 2016, imagine, no? This is a huge success, second point, no? Third point, uh, then in terms of political strategies, I think that we need to look at the, at the um, easy options, where can we change things rapidly, in companies, for example, or as consumers, on the one hand side, and on the other hand side, looking at the most challenging and difficult and important things. No? I'm co-chairing an advisory body to our government, which will be launched in two weeks from now. No? We, we look at the implementation of the 2030 agenda in the German context. No? So uh, the, our, our aim is to focus on the most challenging but most difficult things. Okay. No? Okay. This might be the, the mobility sector in the German case, moving out of carbon in the German case, the difficult things, and combining these difficult things with the success stories, this is very important. Okay, can I just pin you down on this who does what 
element because if we are to identify our roadmap, we need to say, you know, where, and we, we'll look at it and, from the perspective of we looked at media, civil society, private companies, and so on. How do you see, when you see those transnational networks you were talking about that gave you optimism, um, the role of the different players within that? And did your study, does your work reveal anything about that the drivers for cooperation are different for the different players? And I'd like to get a sense from all of you about, about how you see your role within the bigger picture and the role of others. I mean, what we have been seeing is that top-down approaches you know, in the first phase of a transformation do not work. You know, in Copenhagen 2009, we tried to get a big bang on global governance on the ground, and we failed. You know? I was part of that. We designed such a global regime, it failed. You know? And now we do have all these transnational dynamics which do very concrete things, but uh, beyond these doing very concrete things in city alliances or energy alliances or whatever, they create these networks which build global alliances and global consciousness about global cooperation. They build the basics for global governance me mechanisms which we are going to see in the future. So I, I see this, um, this di dialectic you know, between bottom-up processes yeah. on the one hand side and global governance regimes, which we are going to need. No? We need to have them in, in the future, but we probably start bottom up, mm -hmm. having on the top these kind of dialogues and discourses, and this needs to come together at a certain point in time. Okay, Moritz, what for you would make more companies get involved in these sorts of alliances, in these coalitions of the willing, if you like, uh, and play an active part? You said they're at the very beginning. What, how can these guys help mm. to make that case and get them more involved? Yeah, they need to have a business case. And this makes it really hard because we, we have seen that these things are very complex, that even the governments do not yet know how to work on that, and they are not enough or only tiny signals in the markets uh, which try to incorporate these limits. Mm -hmm. And uh, a company is a company to, yeah, to make money. There are other companies or some companies who have also some additional things in mind, but a stock market listed company normally is going in that direction to raise stock market um, um, value. And um, they will invest and spend some money on sustainability issues, but only in a minor case. And if they want to do more, they need to have a business case. And it's really hard to get out of the signals of the market to build up a business case. Okay. We're working with CSR departments and they face the problem. They want to do something within the company, but they need to convince their management and um, how to do that. What's in it for us? There are not enough signals from regulation. There's some pressure from NGOs, but not enough or not in the right direction. And what we think is that um, to some extent also there's some misguidance in pressure. So companies are very much focused to improve their activities in their own premises and forgetting about the complex supply. So they are, le yeah, they are less likely to go into these corporations. Dagmar, you wanted to come in here. And can I just ask, uh, as part of this, who for you, the messenger of the companies civil society, the policy makers. As a journalist, who for you is the most credible messenger? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Actually, none of the above. <laughs> okay, so who does I it? I only get credible messages when I combine the messages of all these exactly. people. Yeah. I mean, uh, and that is something which the public does not like either, to have uh, a lot of uh, voices um, credible or not credible in the view of, of the, the guy who is reading or listening or whatever. Um, but you always only can get a mosaic of, of information and then find your way through. And um, it's very sad that uh, uh, I, I see with my children that it's something they can do as small children and when they go to school they lose their ability to deal with complexity. It's really surprising because uh, our school system obviously still is not able to to handle complexity as a as an education issue. But that would lead us somewhere completely else. What I where <laughs> I wanted to step in is 
Um, you sh I think companies underestimate the possibility that their business case can be destroyed by public, mm. publicity, and NGOs um, as, a, as a whole. And I um, talk a lot with companies about their supply chains because, of course, we heard yesterday from the, um, the woman from Switzerland who was showing us how Switzerland is dealing with the planetary boundaries concept in the governance structures. Um, that is exactly the point. What we are doing here is very relevant in almost every company somewhere completely else. And people are very often not aware of that. The companies could be aware of it. And they have several um, tools where pressure comes from. It's human rights, it's the environment, it's climate, and so on. And there are companies which look at their supply chains very clearly and say, okay, if I have 700 suppliers, I cannot deal with that. I have to reduce that to maybe a hundred and then I want to have a long-term relationship with them and work together with them on how to become better. And I see companies doing that. And so if they are able to do that, why should others not be able to do it? Okay, thank you very much. Doug, you wanted to come in, then I want to come back on this question of different actors and their roles. Kating, I'll come to you in a moment. Yeah. I wanted to pick up the, the company issue yeah. again. I think there are two important um, perspectives. The first one is, I agree with Moritz, that companies, most companies need standards and incentives. No? So getting a price on carbon would change the, the role of the whole investment dynamic a lot. No? Or when China's government is now deciding that electromobility is the future, this will change global markets. So the state regulation put, put under pressure by intergovernmental organizations, this is very important. Then on the other hand side, of course, we also do have pioneers in the field of the private sector changing things. No? Tesla is such a company. If you look into the German energy market, the, the new drivers of change in the German renewable energy market are different from our four big energy companies. So drivers of change are also being uh, located in the business sector itself. And, and does your work, going back to the question I asked earlier, does your work suggest that the drivers for the cooperation are the same for civil society and for companies? In the end, you talked about trust, reciprocity, uh, and so on. Are they the same drivers or are they different for the different actors? I think the important uh, dynamic in a society driving towards transformation is that these different drivers are coming together at the end of the day. Because if you, if you imagine a transformation of the whole society, you need groups from different parts of the society and the private sectors to make this change possible. Okay. Thank you. Katinka and then Heinrich, on this question of, of the role of different actors, who does what and what you've learned from your collaborations and cooperations? So, uh, Dirk, I think the drivers are the same, only the roles are different. So, I see as civil society, we are at the moment, we are doing what you said, we are picking some companies who do very well and put them as an example. Later on, of course, you will give pressure on the laggards. So that is uh, deliberately, we want to give also good examples. We want to be positive, we uh, can do um, uh, way. Another thing is that what you said about um, companies, there's no incentive. Now, I agree there are incentives, there are imago, not only for their brand and consumers, but also to get good employees. Um, but secondly, we say also it's the optimal way to do your risk assessment because ecological risks are huge, especially in the agri and food sector. Uh, the third of all, we work with financial companies and rating agents. Who wants a higher rating and get lower uh, rate of money or get cheaper money? That's a very good economic, in our old economy, uh, stimulation. And fourth of all, if government is going to regulate, and we will keep pressure on that, then if you are there already, you are the best, uh, best boy in town. So we say it's in, we try to approach companies who are not able to make a decision on let's do good or let's do well. A company has shareholders. Yeah. Uh, they need to create shareholder value. I don't know if you saw this morning, Axel Nobel, again, there's an offer. Can they refuse? One of the arguments they use, if we have a takeover or if we are sold, then the environment is in danger because we are so far. The shareholders get 24% more. 
Today is the decision. I'm not sure what there will happen. But you know, this is the pressure companies have. So we have to approach them from the old economic system and give pressure in that way. Thank you. Heinrich, a reaction to this discussion about the role of companies and more broadly how you see Katinka's role, One Planet Thinking uh, initiatives like this and other actors. How, who does what in this global alliance we're trying to build? Yes, okay, there are different players, I think, and the different players have different roles, and we have to accept these roles. And I see also the, VVI, uh, the WWF and the other uh, partners have a big role, and they are strong drivers and uh, give us a push to act uh, in the right direction. And it is not that we only act, we have also other partners who will... Uh, we will feel the reaction of the other partners uh, we have to accept. But I think the most important is the science in this, uh, in this point. I also think about it because science has to make the planetary boundaries understandable. And we cannot find any, uh, we cannot uh, use the pressure if the uh, planetary boundaries are not understand. Uh, and the politicians can understand it and the, also the companies uh, also don't do it. And so I think we have to, make, to lead the basic, that is uh, understand, uh, the understandable of the planetary boundaries and then the other partners can make a pressure and to transform it into real life. Okay, thank you very much. Morris, is there any more that these other actors, these other players can do, do you think, to help companies to see the case, to build the case, to get involved? Is there more uh, that, that, that can be done from outside to, to drive this? Um, yeah, a lot. I think uh, maybe most important is politics, um, to provide long-term long incentives, uh, clear guidance on what is the path forward, because companies uh, need to have, yeah, to know whether it makes sense to invest in something which lasts a bit longer than one or two years, um, if this is the right direction. And if they know that governments are strict on their way and that they can trust in these procedures, then investments... Would and that makes different. the business case for it. Dirk, a quick one and then I'm coming out to all of you. Yeah. I wanted to mention one aspect which we need to focus on, which we haven't discussed still during the, our morning session here. No? Uh, from the German Advisory Council on Global Change, which I'm chairing, chairing, we did a study in 2011 on the group, we talk, called it the Great Transformation. The idea was actually to imagine a global economy and how it needs to change or to transform within planetary boundaries. No? So it was to show which kind of investments do we need, how much does this cost, which sectors need to be involved, all these kind of things. No? I think for Moritz, for you, this might might uh, be an interesting story. I will send it to you. No? Uh, but what we did not, uh, what we did not discuss um, sufficiently in this study, and this is a point which I wanted to mention, is that this kind of transformation has, of course, huge social implications because we are transforming entire sectors, no? and we are asking for transforming entire regions also. And I think we need to have these social implications uh, in mind and bring the social dimension, the social cohesion question together with the planetary boundaries. If we, if we forget this, no, we will be confronted with these counter transformations which we are looking at when we discuss the Trump thing and the Le Pen thing, etc. Et which goes to something you said, Heinrich, at the beginning of the day when you said social justice must be at the core. And I think one of the things that's come out of this uh, before this event was very much thinking in terms of shaping safety. Uh, operating environments now we've added very much safe and just safe and fair this equity question keeps coming back again and again in our discussions any questions or indeed I'm going to give priority to those who haven't spoken and then I'll try and come back uh, and I'm going to ask I'm seeing lots of hands going up now so really quick sharp short it doesn't have to be a question don't invent one if really what you want to do is make a quick comment please and there's one yeah it should be, well, hang on, give him a moment, don't touch it. Try. No. One, two, one, two. No? no? Have we gone off? Something's happened here. Can we switch it with another one? One. No, it's not working. There we go. We have the solution. Thank you very much. One, two. That should work. Try that one. Great. Yeah, so Oscar Savak from Metabolic. Um, one of my questions is that um, we've talked a lot about the role of companies and about the role of consumer markets. But neither companies nor consumer markets have complete control of the areas where 
environmental impact happens most, which is you know, primary producers and smallholders, for example. So my question is, how do we translate and how do we trigger the players that we have access to so that we can transform the areas where we don't have access to? Or how do we design programs that actually reach everybody? Okay, thank you very much and very succinctly put. There was one, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Simona Lovia. I am director of one of those transnational networks, the Global Forest Coalition, which is a coalition with groups oh, yeah. in 56 different countries. I was very much heartened by the remarks of uh, Dr. Neil about the um, importance of the supply chain and the challenges there. I happen to live in Paraguay already for more than 12 years. And actually, uh, Minister Hendricks also already mentioned the big problems with the soy production in Paraguay, which is partly designed for, it, for, for the German market. Um, and the big problem there is actually, I'll try to be brief, but the big problem is quantity. I mean, we have 3.3 million hectares of soy planted in Paraguay in a total agriculture area of 5.5 million hectares, so more than half, which has a huge implication for food security. It uses 9 million okay. liters of paraquat, which is very dangerous paraquat. So the challenge is quantity not just quality. And I know there's been industry working together with NGOs in qualitative roundtables. For the Paraguayan social movement, Very that briefly, is not sorry. a solution because you need quantity. And the problem, and we discussed it yesterday at the working group, is that corporations are institutionally not capable of talking about quantitative measures. Not the good people that are trying to improve production okay. because there's a limit. Point is made. So does that, that not ma mean that if you talk about sharp regulatory measures... Sorry, this measures, is turning into a speech. I'm, I'm <laughs> finishing here. That you need to exclude corporation from that standard setting. That's my question. Okay, so they don't get involved because they, can't, they shouldn't be involved because they can't see it in the way that we need to see it, if put very simply. And sorry to be so brutal, but I'm seeing lots of hands and I need to give the panel a chance to respond. Please. And there was another one here somewhere, two there. Okay, and then I come back to the middle. Thank you very much, uh, Julia Truhl. My question is the necessary culture hold change. The, mic up a bit. That's it. Uh, the necessary culture change we need to have to change things. Both the CEOs, the boardroom members, and the politicians are being judged on a short-term basis. They have four years mm. to get a good bonus. They have four years to uh, be uh, voted in again. So how can we expect these kind of people in the culture of short-termness to think long-term and be brave enough to uh, maybe, for example, a company that produces deodorants to say we don't need that stuff. We don't need plastic in shampoos and we don't need plastic bottles around shampoos. So how can we force these people or how can we motivate these people to change their culture? And to get that political courage uh, that we will need. Thank you. Yeah, about political courage. Um, Can you introduce yourself? Javier Cura yeah. from Argentina, from, from Argentina Environmental uh, Center in Argentina called Rincón. Um, uh, um, Dr. Johan uh, Rockstrom in another conference said that uh, the fossil industry at this moment is receiving roughly around uh, uh, 10 more um, uh, direct or indirect subsidies than the renewable energy. Uh, what would take, and this is the, uh, common known, this is known by all the people and undermines the trust in the political system. What would it take to oblige the, politicals, the politics and the political system to uh, f uh, foster this change? Okay. Because this, you were talking about 90% private investments, but what about the politics? Okay, thank you very much. We're going to take a couple more and then we'll have to come back, otherwise the panel won't have time to respond. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Rüdiger Röhrig, the Natural Step Germany. I'm also wearing another hat. It's Sustainable Growth Associates, a certified B Corp. We're actually working a lot with CEOs. In my opinion, I would actually like to do, uh, say something in favor of CEOs. Is I think we have to connect with a daily agenda, which is short-term, long-term, top-line, bottom-line. And if we don't learn to speak their language, it's going to be difficult. With that experience that we've made ourselves, we also learned it's not just one specific group or one specific industry. There are just CEOs out there who are never going to get it, and others who already embarked uh, towards a journey for transformation. And I think if we win them, it could actually go very quickly, because living in accelerating times, I think it now becomes also a matter of survival for the uh, for mm. we made. 
Thank you very much. And the question of time frames, we heard short-termism in politics, and we had this point yesterday about companies and the way they think, and sh more short-term, and the way science thinks, and how do you square that circle. I did promise I'd come back to you if I could, and I can if I can get round the monitor and the laptop. Thank you. I would like to know what you think uh, about world religions. Oh, goodness me. For being alive. <laughs> He's opening up a whole can of worms. Already, already 20 years ago, at the Deutsche Bundesstiftung Umwelt, there was a congress together with International Network for Environmental Management about the possibilities of getting world religions as allies. There were representatives of Protestant, Protestant Church, Catholic Church, Orthodox Church, Jewish Church, Islam, Shinto, Hindu, okay. and all world religions. And uh, there were very interesting outcomings, and I think we could find very strong allies there. And I think a, a key point here, more broadly, about coalitions between people you may never have worked with before, do we need to look for these new allies, these, whether it be religious organizations or anything else? Lots of different issues. Uh, perhaps we could take the, the specific sort of supply chain questions, related questions first. Can anybody come in on that point first? How do we reach those we don't have direct access to and this quantity question? Katinka. So, uh, thank you, Oscar, for Matt Bullock. Um, for your questions, I think it's a, it's a very important question and not easy to solve. However, we looked at, um, in, at, at this issue in the Living Planet report of 2016, where we saw that 1% of the companies has own or use 67% of Earth. This is the 1% we will focus on at the moment. And we will re reach out, for example, to the five large traders which, which trade almost all our food. So in the whole supply chain, there are some small areas where everything is coming together, and that is where we have to put the pressure on. Because reaching out to all smallholders is important, but will not change in the speed we have to change at the moment. So that is at the moment our vision, but I think everything can help if people have other ideas on this, because this is a complex issue. Okay, Dirk, on this issue, we'll come to the others in a moment. No, regarding, I understood the question uh, in the sense that how do we reach the most vulnerable people? No, no. <laughs> yeah. What, what I want, what I wanted to, what I wanted to say is that um, we need to take, we need to to have the numbers right. The the 30 percent at the at the bottom of the global pyramid of consumers, their pressure on the Earth system is near zero. So people who need to change behavior and people who need to rethink their consumption patterns, these are the one billion people in uh, OECD countries and the three billion people in new middle classes uh, growing up now in emerging economies. So this is what we need to focus on to, uh, if we try to think about change. If I understood the question, this is more about those in the supply chain who we as consumers don't have direct, we can't influence their behavior. Is that what? No? Oh, shh. Jesus, excuse my language. So, assuming that we have identified one of these <laughs> groups that have control or influence microphone. on these 67 percent of the, of the primary suppliers, the question is, how do we design a program so that they change what happens outside their walls and so that that change happens in a positive way so that it doesn't lead to exclusion, dispossession, uh, burden shifting and so on. Okay. So we have the, the company with the power, how do we make that power be used in a good way outside of the company? Right. So how their behavior with their own supply chain. Any thoughts? Yes. Yeah, I think the, the problem is really huge and it's, there's not an easy solution. And I think what you mentioned is an approach in that direction. From my perspective, I see it very pragmatic. So we need to help companies first to better understand their supply chains, then to find the hotspots where to um, yeah, interfere in the supply chains. And this is not a great solution, but many different tiny steps in ho hopefully the right direction. But in the end, we need to solve the issue in the supply chains worldwide because there's um, probably the, the biggest pressure in that direction. Okay. Uh, Heinrich and Dagmar, in terms of this, this uh, culture shift, 
and a question there about politicians and short-termism. I'm reminded in a different context of something Jean-Claude Juncker said, in fact, when he was Luxembourg Prime Minister, when somebody said, you know, why isn't EU, the EU reforming in the way it needs to? He says, we know what we need to do. We just have no idea how to get elected again after we've done it. And that would be the answer of many politicians to some of the dilemmas that we are facing. How do you convince them to show the courage? And this question of their short-termism versus some of the long-term strategies we need here. Yes, I told it this morning uh, that the long-term uh, value should be in the front of the decisions and uh, th therefore we have to make a change. Uh, in the, uh, also in the shareholder value that, this, uh, that the system of sustainability will be a pillar in the decisions for the future of the companies. And so I think it would be change on the basic of uh, of um, uh, and, uh, of uh, uh, ethologic uh, uh, basic, we have to change the system and uh, that the companies can always act for a lot of years and not only for three months and so that you can earn, can earn money in a short time, you have to do it in a long time. Yeah. And that's that's the companies. Yes. What about the politicians yes, who are po much more worried about the regional elections coming up in a month's time or the national elections later in the year or whatever it might be? But I think that's a long-term process to change the mind of the people and uh, to think out of elections and also to uh, stabilize the system. Okay, so yeah, Dagmar. Um, on the politician question, I think um, to have a look at the development of our German Chancellor is very useful because in the beginning she was always only seen as a flip-flopper, looking where the people think they might want to go and then taking decisions. In her method she didn't change, but uh, she got respect in a moment when, uh, in, in two topics, when she was genuine and when, when she was just standing, standing to, to her position, and that was in the climate issue and in the refugee issue. And the respect, of course, the hate too, but the respect came in the moment when she just stood. And I think that is a, um, something every politician can learn. Um, you cannot expect people to believe you when they know that you are hiding something or that you don't want to talk about it, although you know you have to talk about it. And if there's something in the middle of the room and you just tiptoe around and don't talk about it, people sense that. And so it's always easier, actually, in um, risk or crisis communication, it's the same. You better spit it out and say what's there and then give some solutions how you think you can deal with that. And if it is a long-term thing, then you have to say, okay, maybe I will not finish this, but I'm sure when I start this, somebody will pick it up. Mm. I mean, that is how you can communicate as a politician. Which goes back to Heinrich's point earlier about don't oversimplify complexity. Be honest, be straightforward about it. Dirk, a reaction to this, and, and if, I, if I could, you talked about in your presentation uh, multi-level governance stagnating. Um, is there anything we need to do in relation to the planetary boundary concept and this downscaling and so on? Or should we say, okay, for the moment that is not the avenue, we can't use that avenue, let us focus on building these transnational networks where you were more optimistic? If you allow me, I Please wanted, first, first, yeah. first, first yeah. wanted to pick up your question about cultural change of CEOs yeah. and other guys and other people. No, I think that three elements need to come together. The first one is we are in the middle of a moral revolution. No, accepting planetary boundaries at the end of the day is ex as accepting that slavery is un unacceptable or child labor is unacceptable. So we have been seeing this kind of moral revolutions in the past. We need a new one. So it is about, this is about discourses. This is about narrative. This is about talking about it. No? Then this is, of course, not enough. Then we need institutional change and new standards and new incentives. You talked about this, Moritz. No? So writing the planetary boundaries into our regulatory frameworks, carbon budget, for example. No? And this, so this is about institutional change. And the third element is then uh, about what Heinrich already said, education. I mean, look at our business schools. No? Where are we discussing in our business schools planetary boundaries? Nowhere. No? So uh, we need to think about these uh, different, uh, it's, it's a moral revolution, it's an institutional shift, and we need a new type of, in, of education. Now the question about 
um, should we invest more in transnational networks or in the other uh, elements of the, of the whole architecture? No? Uh, I think these transnational networks are absolutely key and we should invest in those, we should support those, work in those, because this is, these are the networks in which the, the, the culture of cooperation will emerge or not emerge. Mm. This is what I'm saying. No? But at the ad other uh, end of the spectrum, of course, we also need to work with national governments and support multilateral institutions. As they are so weak currently and under pressure, we need to support them. We as academics can support them. In the media, we can support them. Transnational actors can support multilateral organizations because we are going to need them. So my uh, answer wouldn't be, only focus on the transnational networks, but focus on the other elements too, but the transnational networks can, can be very help important us drivers. To get there. Thank you very much. Um, any other comments to that before we move on? Dagmar? Uh, no, I would like to pick up the subsidy question. Yes. Um, because uh, in a way it is a no-brainer. Everybody understands that this is only stupid, but that doesn't help. It doesn't help in the concrete situation. If you um, look at the story how Nigeria tried to scrap these subsidies, you have a situation where there's no trust in the political system at all. And then a government comes and says, we will make your fuel more expensive. Fuel in Nigeria is as well power as mobility. Um, and that for you get education which they didn't get the last 50 years. So how should that work? That is politically complete sub okay. uh, suicide. Yeah? Um, and on the other hand, you have situations like in Germany, where we have a subsidy report, which is given by the government every year, in which the biggest subsidies are not in, because the finance minister says that is not a subsidy, like um, the, uh, making um, diesel more cheap. Um, tax-wise and making um, uh, flight um, fuel uh, completely tax-free. That is not in the subsidy report. Okay. That is the biggest numbers. And so that I, what I want to say is in the subsidy issue, you have to go into the details and then really go to every single case and try to find okay. solutions for that. Okay. We are almost out of time. Kitty, it has to be 30 seconds if you could, because then we need to draw some conclusions. 30 seconds. Um, Politics is chosen by the consumer and the people, and it's a reflection of that. I think we, we are running a program, we are also starting a movement together. And that is what we have to do, and that is a movement we are not under control, and we cannot put all signs in we want, but that movement on social media, on what we want to bring, that will bring consumers who choose the politicians and appreciate what they do in action, and that is what we have to do. Okay, and I think you probably just answered my last question. We're going to hear in a moment uh, about some of the elements of a roadmap for moving forward. For each of you, Moritz, I'll start with you and I'll go down the line and give Heinrich the last word. If for each of you, you had to identify one thing that you think needs to be in that roadmap if we are to really make the planetary boundaries concept work, if we are to build on the progress to date and bring about the transformation that we need, what for each of you is the one thing you'd like to see in that road, roadmap in about 30 seconds each? I know, I'm really fair. <laughs> Moritz first. Make it easy to understand and so provide guidance for implementation on a company level. Okay, Katinka. Uh, translate planetary boundaries to methodologies uh, for companies to implement and work together on the movement to start working with the consumers together. Thank you very much. Dirk? Uh, I think it, um, important is knowledge, joint knowledge creation and uh, knowledge diffusion and to, to give an optimistic note no, that based on science and the IPCC and climate research, having now a debate on transforming the whole en global energy system, the whole global economy, might be a signal that we can give, have, have this uh, transformation without a crisis beforehand. Thank you very much. Dagmar. From my media perspective, I would wish to have a financer for certain media projects that uh, target directly into groups we do not reach, like migrants. That is a very important group because they translate the concept back to, to their home. They would be wonderful communicators if we would ever try to reach them, which we normally don't do. Or 
that kind of stuff. I'm, I, do, I do not really have a good concept how to do that, but I know that it would be a good target group. And if the planetary boundaries concept is understood by the refugees that came two years ago, um, they might understand a bit better what happened to themselves, and they might be able to talk to their families about it in a way they understand it. So make them ambassadors for change as well. Exactly. Thank you. Heinrich, you have the last word. Yes, I think uh, we have to add our recommendations for the banking sector, and I do think it would be very good uh, also in, uh, in adding the pillars uh, of the financial sector, we have to uh, add the economic, uh, the, 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 the ecological and the social pillars uh, to add in the Basel II uh, agreement, and that would be, I think, a new sign to go forward. And on that note, will you join me in thanking our panel very much indeed. Thank you to you all <laughs> for a very stimulating <laughs> session. And they have begun there for each of them uh, to identify perhaps some unexpected areas of focus uh, as we look to the future. Now what we want to do um, is to get some impressions and some preliminary results from some breakout groups that have been working together and drawing on the discussions uh, at this conference to begin, as I say, to identify those elements of a roadmap of how to move forward. I should say they're not going to try and summarize what happened in your workshops. They're far too rich. There was far too much being discussed. A Note has been taken of the discussions in every group and there will be a conference report which will be posted uh, when it's ready on the conference website. You will also, those of you registered to participate, that's why you're here, you'll get an email uh, with that report when it is ready. But what we really are going to hear now is what they have identified uh, as, as I say, um, some elements of that roadmap on how to move forward. Let me bring all three of them up onto the stage to talk about the roadmap for politics. Dr. Jorg Maya Rees, who from the Federal Ministry for the Environment, Nature Conservation Building and Nuclear Safety, and a senior fellow at the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies. Where is Jorg? There he is. Please, do. You can go straight to the podium because you're going to be first. Uh, for science, you heard from him yesterday, Professor Dr. Wolfgang Lucht, co-chair Earth System Analysis at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. Please do come and join me in the comfy seats. And on the private sector, Dr. Volker Berding, uh, Stiftungsentwicklung, I looked that up. Does it mean something to do with development? Yes, yeah, development. development. Thank you very much. German Federal Environmental Foundation. I really must learn more German, ladies and gentlemen, for the future. Um, but a very warm welcome to you. I'm going to ask you to do the impossible. Five minutes each uh, in terms of trying to identify those key elements of the roadmap forward. Can I start with you, Jörg? You can either stand up or you can can grab the handheld microphone, whatever you feel more comfortable with. So from a political perspective, what does the roadmap look like? Yeah, thank you for the possibility. We just finished our work within a group of eight, nine people. So I'm just trying to uh, summarize that, but it is my personal view and we will work out the small paper after the conference. Uh, perhaps as a kind of understanding where we st start from uh, coming to political uh, proposals is, that we see uh, planetary boundaries is a good concept as framing a lot of debates which we uh, urgently need. Um, we have a political challenge that, for example, in the Agenda 2030 in the Paris Agreement, we don't find concrete uh, reference to the planetary boundaries still. So we have uh, in also in other debates we are missing that. We have also a scientific challenge still in a lot of dimensions the one is uh, getting these uh, planetary boundaries in the environmental aspect downscaled, uh, making concrete and robust indicators and targets and so on and so forth. But we have also the dimension of uh, enhancing it by social dimensions and economic dimensions, so to integrate it with other concepts. And um, to, we have the whole uh, bunch of communicative problems to integrate it in the uh, public sphere. So this is still a big, uh, big challenge politically, scientifically, and from the communication side. So I think one basis for political action is to be very careful with this concept, really ambitious, but on the same time very careful, and it is one concept in, uh, in, in a bunch of others, and the question is how to integrate and making a, a consistent picture for all these uh, challenges. So 
What we think is, as a political ambition, of course, I think we share that in this room, the political ambition is to, to, to stay in the, what Wolfgang Lucht yesterday described, the Holocene-like Anthropocene, uh, the safe and just space on the global level, but also on the regional and even local level. So this is the political ambition, so to reband the emission uh, hockey sticks, which we all uh, have uh, seen uh, also in these two days. That means the entry point should be uh, not making up a new uh, forum and a new political debate about planetary boundaries isolated but integrated in the SDG debate. So we think that the, we can't lay back and say we have the agenda 2030, it's complete, it's perfect, just let's wait. No, we have to uh, integrate the planetary boundaries much more strongly into this agenda. Uh, making, uh, for example, in the Global Sustainability Report, a clear uh, reference to planetary boundaries and look in how far we could qualify the SDGs more by planetary boundaries. To do so, as I said, I think the Global Sustainability Report could be one thing. And to foster this debate, of course, we need then um, uh, targeted uh, dialogues which policy could foster. Uh, on, on the German level, on the national level, but also on the EU level, we, we debated mostly within EU colleagues. So it's about how could EU commission, how could environmental agency, how could, for example, a network, which I'm part of, uh, the EU SD, um, SDSN, um, not SDSN, um, ESDN network of, of um, policy makers and uh, administrative people, foster a debate between member countries about planetary boundaries, fostering this debate also between federal level and regional level, like we saw it in, in Switzerland, uh, we should do that, but also making a business dialogue uh, or a business policy dialogue to get more concrete uh, understanding of what planetary boundaries meet, um, means and also with science, with journalists, with media and so on. So we think this sectoral <coughs> dialogue is something policy should foster. We try to do that also, I think, from the ministry. And then um, just looking for my um, notes. Um, by this, we should, as I said, come to this sustainability qualifying planetary boundaries because we think uh, there's still missing our understanding. And then if we have this understanding, I would refer to what Dirk uh, said, Dirk Messner, uh, we need to prove how planetary boundaries is creating such a space for more trust, a more re-feeling, a vision where to go because we think there's a potential in the planetary boundaries to, to, to be part of a of a basis for cooperation, but there are still a lot of problems. So we think that the notion of a safe and just space uh, is perhaps a more interesting notion for to debate because it also includes the social aspects. It includes then the space of innovation and economic action. And this is absolutely relevant to go politically in a, in a negotiable uh, way. Otherwise, I think we will have uh, blockings um, on this way. So this is uh, a high ambition, uh, but on short term, I've, uh, of course, we can only first start, I think, with communication and dialogue, also reaching, of course, the, uh, the education system, the innovation system, the research system. So that's what I would Thank like to say. Thank you very much Thanks. indeed. Thank you. <laughs> a very rich set of recommendations in a very short period of time. For science, Wolfgang, what does the roadmap look like? Yeah, so we had also nice discussions in a quite large group. Um, thank you for all the contributions. Um, the situation we have is that we have climate science, earth system science, um, as you can see on one side. On the other hand, increasingly we have SDG implementation research and agendas. And there's this middle ground, uh, which is still missing. Planetary boundaries donut research. It's more than just climate science. Planetary boundaries is eight other dimensions next to climate interacting. But it's not just SDG research. It is a particular concept because it's a, a concept founded on the natural sciences, of course, with implementations for the social sciences. So let's discuss a little bit about what uh, the science agenda for that new big program should be, you know, if only we could get some of the money that, uh, that we have in the research funding system. So here's a diagram where on the one side we have like system understanding, on the other system governance. I'm just going to put some islands with some keywords in here to show you some big elements of that research program. One is uh, what we call a planetary boundary simulator or planetary boundaries interaction simulator. 
Uh, the normal atmosphere ocean general circulation models will not do the job. They're focused on resolving the atmosphere and these processes. We need something based around the biosphere. The biosphere has to be central, the agricultural systems, uh, the human land use dimensions, plus the climate system, of course, um, also the oceanic uh, biosphere. So we need uh, different types of models. We have all the components, but they need to be tied together for this task so that we can model the interactions between planetary boundaries. Then we have a pathways work, which here are called SDG pathways, but they are also general more transformative pathways. Um, this is the domain of integrated assessment, um, putting numbers on the pathways that, that achieve sustainability within planetary boundaries or look at the trade-offs and the problems. Then we have something in the more conceptual domain for now, social ecological complexity. This is really social ecological systems analysis, uh, a huge uh, domain. Um, then we have implementation research, also a huge field. This whole, all this research on the institutions, on, on policy interfaces, discussion of society. And then we have something we call orders and ontologies. Uh, with orders, we mean cultural orders, natural orders. What's the position of humans in the world? How do they see them? How do cultures see it? Uh, what, uh, what is the, the relationship between humans and the natural environment? And all these things, but also the languages we use, the way we speak about them. Um, all these topics from the humanities that are brought in. And then, of course, we have like bullet lists. This is just the short version. There are many more bullets, but some important ones. Um, I can't go into them for lack of time, but for the simulator, it's a whole systems approach with a particular focus on the biosphere, as I mentioned. And humans have to be put into them as, as biogeochemical actors, as collective biogeochemical actors. So we need an anthropobiogeochemistry, and that's something that the current Earth system models don't have at all. It's all just in scenarios. Uh, we need to look at the hotspots, the teleconnections. There's a lot of nexus research um, behind this, land, water, energy, agriculture, etc. And the tipping point aspect has been emphasized a lot. On the SDG pathways, uh, what Jeffrey Sachs called uh, feasibility of normative paths, they need to be quantified. What numbers can we put to them, particularly also beyond 2030 long-term goals? Um, the quantification of SSPs and the the planetary boundaries concept could be used as a benchmarking against evaluating SDGs. So if the planetary boundaries uh, wording is not in the SDGs, but they could be evaluated against the SDGs, and first work like that is appearing. Um, social metabolic governance, uh, governance of techno systems is an interesting topic. Of course, the instruments, the social economic instruments like taxation, etc., need to be explored. Uh, Non-monetary metrics, synergies, and trade-offs. In social ecological complexity, the question, you know, we always, you know, the green part of the donut, uh, the, the famous green part of the donut, but under what conditions does it even exist? Uh, probably some s structural conditions and some environmental conditions have to be fulfilled in order for that space to even exist. And uh, systems analysis can do a lot about that. Co-evolutionary dynamics, uh, co-evolutionary tipping points, the knock-on effects, tipping points in the earth, in the climate system, tipping points in the impact system, tipping points in the social systems and the feedbacks, also through the largest feedback in the earth system, which is the brains we have. Uh, the topology of desirable states, a lot can be said about that. Uh, metrics, um, agency, network, and complexity. How do we get more human agency into all of the modeling? Implementation research, uh, science society interfaces, translation work, and the integration of knowledge into decision-making cycles maybe needs rethinking also in a research mode. Um, the global footprints work that we heard uh, about this morning um, is very important. Uh, environmental justice, security, legitimacy, cooperation, institutions, all that are research topics in themselves, not just uh, uh, practical topics, but also they desire some research. Um, green circular economy, green economy, so it's a long list of nice things, but there is a research agenda that right now is existing, but is not systematically pursued. Orders of ontolo and ontologies, um, as I said, natural, social, cultural, and political orders, mindsets, worldviews, and the shared meanings from common language where it can be established or negotiated. Reconnecting with the biosphere is an important aspect, and discourse on risk, risk perception, precautionary principles, uh, transformation narratives, and so on. Finally, uh, there was a lot yesterday talking to Catherine Richardson, Johan Rockström, and Detlef van Furen and so on about some procedural developments that we would advise. Um, regular planetary boundary assessments could be discussed. For example, a regular evaluation of SDG evolution uh, with respect to the planetary boundaries. National sectoral assessments could be good to have the numbers. Uh, dialogue platforms with business and finance and dialogue platforms on equity. Uh, cost of inaction reports and research gap analysis. Maybe we need an advisory group on concepts and definitions to, to uh, 
clear up some of the misunderstandings that, that abound. And of course, we need more cooperation on the modeling scenarios and the data cube aspects. So they're all interconnected. They're not separate islands. They're all part of one uh, um, you know, multicolored painting. And there are some big initiatives that are in that domain. Uh, this is pretty sketchy at this point. So Future Earth, the TWI 2050 initi initiative, SDSN, the Earth League uh, protecting some things, and then the power of universities, particularly in the humanities, but also the UN as a body where such things can be discussed uh, are the players. Um, and uh, of course, there are others as well. Thank you, Wolfgang. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. So, a complex roadmap, much work to be done. Uh, thank you very much for uh, summarizing it so succinctly. The private sector, we talked a lot, particularly in our last panel, about the role of the private sector. Volker, what's yeah. the roadmap look like? Yeah, we, um, we had different uh, difficult discussions in our group, and uh, we were in the mid of the discussion while we had a look at the watch and see how we have to finish. <laughs> and um, we actually didn't finish, of course, our discussion. I think it's a sign, maybe there uh, is a collision, not really a collision, but a uh, new interaction between two worlds, the worlds of the private sector and the scientific and sustainability discussion uh, sector. So um, I think we have to learn to, to get a bit more compatible in the discussions. And, uh, but I think this is a start, and this is also a good thing we can do with uh, the planetary boundaries. Um, these, these uh, slides, I've got two slides, are really uh, quick and dirty, and we had to, to try to focus some results uh, that we can agree on. And um, one main part was to say that the planetary boundaries con uh, concept is able to set a context so uh, that companies can be informed about limits and relativity, meaning um, what can be their share or their part in the planetary boundaries or in the, in the concept of planetary boundaries and where are my limits for my company. So what we know are not able to is to say uh, they are di direct derivable goals from the planetary boundaries. Uh, for companies, but companies can set their own goals viewing the planetary boundaries concept. So it's the job of the companies or, or the aim of the companies to find these kind of goals and the planetary boundaries concept can be the scientific uh, framework for this. So, so what the added value for sustainable businesses uh, given by the planetary boundaries concept. Um, so it can give added value if the, they are added, the adapted, so the boundaries, the concept is adapted to the company's context. So there's no solution one size fits all or one solution fits all, but this is the concept where companies can adapt or use adapted solutions for themselves. And um, they can also give a benefit if they are, um, if they fit with other kind of frameworks, for example, GRI or the UN Global Compact, SDG as assessment, ESR, and not every three-letter word, it's here I know by myself, but the companies know them. And um, so this is something, um, the, the concept can fit to existing um, frameworks. And they can give also added value if they are seen from the value chain perspective, not just uh, from a single product, but with all the um, deriving and, and the, the following processes and the incoming processes um, seen together. And um, yeah, that can also help um, the company to, to go to a direction and to set goals, as I mentioned before. So this is no concept that sets the goals themselves in a, sp in a very concrete way, but it can be scaled down by the companies and can help them to solve their problems and make them sustainable. So companies, um, which especially companies with works, which work with resources um, can, can um, ha have the aim to, to um, stay alive for the next 100 years. And so they have to find ways to, to deal with limited resources, for example. And so it's their own goal to develop solutions, how they can uh, recycle products and so on, for example. And yeah, what are the benefits of the planetary bonus concept for, for the private sector? For the first time, um, the companies can account for their impacts on the ecosystem. So they have got an idea what their work, um, what their um, business model maybe has some kind of impact on planetary boundaries, on, on, uh, on the limits, on ecosystems. And the companies can use the concept um, to make an awareness for themselves, but also to show we are doing something. We are not just um, 
yeah, institutions which pollute the environment, but we make a contribution to save the planet. And this concept can help to do so. We also had an unfinished discussion how this fits to small and medium-sized companies, um, mm. enterprises. We didn't finish. Maybe this works very well for large companies, but for small companies which are not really global active and have no re big research and, and sustainability departments. Uh, for them, is maybe a different task to deal with this concept and we couldn't finish this discussion <laughs> at this moment. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Volker. Please do come and sit down for a moment. We have just um, a couple of minutes left while we wait for the Parliamentary State Secretary to arrive. So I wanted to ask you and thank you very much to all the members of your groups uh, for the contribution that they have made. Uh, you have all enumerated a number of areas, a number of elements for the roadmaps. And now taking your rapporteur hat off for a moment uh, because you've been very faithful to the processes that you've been involved in. For each of you, and it can be in your own area or it can be in another area. So, uh, Jörg, you can pick something from the political sphere, but also from science and the private sector. For each of you, it's the same question I've really been asking everybody for the last two days. A personal priority, a personal key next step for where we need to go from here in order to, going back to the title of our event, make the planetary boundary concept work. Jörg, would it be something you think in the political sphere where you were focusing, or is it something in the science, some of those areas that Wolfgang was enumerating? Uh, where do you see the priority, your personal priority, as we leave this conference? Um, well, as I'm at this, in this year, just on the, on the border between these two, on the boundary between these Indeed two uh, <laughs> spheres, I would like to also make a, perhaps a remark on this a specific link. I think uh, I was a member of the whole process of creating this research project leading to this conference and also this conference. So the idea was also here to bring together, I think, four communities, science community, economics, business community, uh, the media and journalists, and also the people who educate and, and multiplicate information in this way uh, of direction, and policy, of course. So I think what I would like to have is that to take the planetary boundaries concept as a starting point to translate it and to enhance it with other concepts. So I think, for example, between business and uh, science or business and planetary boundaries, I think that the whole question of uh, that, there is a, that this is a risk concept showing about systemic uh, interlinkages, this is a very relevant uh, idea for business and also for policymakers. It's not the boundary, it's more the risk uh, viewing a crisis like uh, Dick Messner described it, if we have a crisis uh, which can lead to destruction of planet, that's too late. We, uh, but risk is a notion where we can work politically and I think also in the financial sector and in the business sector. This, so be more concrete, what is the relationship for example between these cooperation ideas and the planetary boundaries concept, make that more clear. Or the footprint idea we discussed yesterday between uh, Switzerland and, the, and, and other concepts that the bottom-up footprint idea, the consumption-based perspective and the planetary boundaries top-down uh, earth system modeling based perspective have to be integrated or at least linked because this links also of course actors. Okay. It's not only science, it's then the consumers on the other side and we need but more precise uh, debates on that and this is uh, my idea to make these dialogues. I'm very happy that the uh, the uh, DBU is taking up, for example, this med small medium or other enterprises into a dialogue, perhaps also with policy, to get more concrete because I think it makes no sense if we have another uh, notion in the okay. world, planetary boundaries, and put all the things under this umbrella and in 10 years we'll take the next one. This is dis okay. disturbing for policy and I think it's not helpful, even not for scientists and others. Thank you very much. Wolfgang, for you, there was an increase or mosaic of priorities. Would you identify one of those in the scientific area as the most important thing, or is there something else you would identify as your personal key next step? Well, for the scientific work, I think that to advance our Earth system models to a point where they can actually inform the public debate in a systematic manner, that would be very desirable, and we're not there in terms of the research structure and the research funding. But beyond that, I think it really is in the culture. The key question is, what do we do with our freedom? And I think most people on this planet 
independent of the culture, religion, nations, etc., would agree that a certain respect for life and a certain respect for the dignity of things, people would be able to agree on that, that this is something that is important to us, as, that makes us humans and that's part of our own dignity. And, the, and so I think this is the most important thing. Now the question is what actually takes away our freedom to act in that way? And of course it's, it's the pressures of need and poverty and all that, but it's also a lot of macro systems we created. We created all these big technological and institutional systems that we struggle with, with governing them um, to, to keeping this thing on track. And we somehow have to regain control over that um, if the okay. first is to be achieved. And, and, and that, I think, deep down is also a matter of how we see ourselves and our cultures and, and, and whether we feel we are slaves of the systems, which often probably we are. Um, but also we have to fight for the freedoms that we have to make such decisions based on our self-identification. I think the problem right today is that, that there is no re nothing really on offer. The big okay. you know, transformation narrative that we have now, like with the national nation that the isolationism, we have to have a vision of 2050 okay. for us. Thank you very much, Volker. Your personal priority. Yes, I'll make it quick. <laughs> um, I think um, one, one thing could be to really try to find um, concrete goals for uh, several parts of business and, uh, and, and, and society and to derive really um, targets from, from the planetary boundaries concept because the concept of planetary boundaries um, gives sometimes um, the image that there are fixed numbers in the concept we can just uh, read and then, then, uh, and then adapt. But um, there are no concrete numbers and uh, so we should not overestimate or to see the, the concept too literally but to derive direct goals from the concept as a scientific background. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, will you join me in thanking all three of them and the groups that they've been working with very much for such rich uh, roadmaps. We know where we need to go. We know what we need to do. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. You may return to the comfortable seats. And now, as our conference comes to a close, it is my pleasure and honor to give the floor to the Parliamentary State Secretary, Rita Schwarzenegger Sutter, Federal Ministry for the Environment, Nature Conservation, Building and Nuclear Safety, to bring proceedings to a close. A very warm welcome, and over to you. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to hear that this two-day conference has been a very interesting intensive and fruitful experience. We are delighted that uh, our event met with such a positive uh, response and led to such constructive uh, discussions. And first glance, it is uh, rather unusual for ministry and policy makers to tackle the issue of boundaries and uh, to host a large international conference on this subject. Um, Setting boundaries uh, for state measures, corporate activities and actions by our citizens is not an attractive uh, prospect. This is especially true when it comes to ecological boundaries that appear to confirm the accusation repeatedly leveled at environmental policy, that is the policy of uh, prohibition. However, the past two days have clearly illustrated that the debate on planetary boundaries opens up enormous uh, opportunities, including economic, uh, economic ones. Let's take the climate change boundary as an example. Thanks to Germany's pioneering role in international climate policy, innovative German companies are well positioned and on the global market for environmental and efficiency technologies. The value of this global market is currently 2.5 trillion euros and according to estimates this will at least double by 2025. Companies in the environmental technology and resource efficiency sectors already provide around 1.5 million jobs in Germany. In 2014 the costs of fossil energy imports from abroad totaled 80.5 billion euros. By increasing the use of renewable energy sources in Germany and saving energy, we will be able to reduce dependence on energy imports and lower the burden on the state budget. Last November, the German government adopted the Climate Action Plan 2050. It pursues the guiding principle, principles 
of expensive greenhouse gas neutrality of the economy by the middle of this century. Implementing the goals contained in this plan will trigger investments in almost all sectors and will have a positive effect on economic growth, innovation and employment in Germany. The positive impacts on employment are particularly noticeable in the construction, real estate, consulting and energy sectors. The Climate Action Plan 2050 is a modernization strategy for the German economy. We are convinced. I would also like to highlight a second example. As you know, and as you have discussed over the past two days, the planetary boundary for nitrogen has been well exceeded. At global level, the annual release of anthropogenic reactive nitrogen has increased tenfold since the middle of the 19th century. Nitrogen oxides in the air and nitrate in drinking water are damaging damaging human health. The nitrogen or compound laughing gas is contributing to climate change. Nitrogen inputs in ecosystems are leading to biodiversity loss. Oxygen-free oxygen, oxygen dead zones can arise in our oceans. Nitrogen pollution is leading to considerable damage to businesses and the economy. For the European Union, the costs of the harmful impacts of the current nitrogen emissions of all 27 member states are estimated at between 70 and 320 billion euros per year. In other words, the costs are just as high, if not much higher, than the estimated economic gains of 20 to 80 uh, billion euros per year, for example, from increased yields in the agricultural sector. Around 60% of this figure are costs to health, 35% are costs of ecosystems, and 5% are costs of the climate, to the climate. A study has been carried out on the nitrogen footprints of 188 nations. It put Germany in second place on the list of the world's largest net nitrogen importers. This is why the issue of reducing our nitrogen footprint is also on the agenda. The German government is currently in the process of agreeing in an integrated policy and an approach to nitrogen reduction, including all sectors and media. This will provide a basis for us to pursue a coherent strategy over the years ahead to reduce nitrogen emissions to a manageable level. Just like climate policy, nitrogen policy can also trigger innovation, thus promoting employment and modernization. In other words, acknowledging boundaries can lead to huge opportunities. And that is exactly what this conference was about, highlighting the, opportunity, the opportunities of the concept of planetary boundaries and discussing how we can make even greater use of them for policy making, economy and society. I get the impression that you made major progress in answering these questions in your discussions over the past two days. And um, I'm very impressed by the results of the workshops and especially of the breakout groups. They provide an excellent basis for moving forward on the road to practical implementations of the concept. And the breakout groups would not have been able to achieve these outcomes without all the excellent presentations, panel discussions, workshops and contributions. I would therefore like to thank you all for your committed participation in our conference. The fact that you came together from such a broad range of stakeholder groups to talk to each other was very productive. The diversity of perspectives on the concept was extremely useful of the conference. I would like to thank the German Federal Foundation and the Federal Environment Agency for the comprehensive support for the conference. I would also like to thank Adelphi, the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research and the Stockholm Environment Institute for the excellent preparation and organization of the conference. Further thanks go to Czech. Jackie Davis, for the excellent moderations. Planetary Bound. Yeah. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jackie. Planetary boundaries coupled with the objective of a life in dignity for everyone have to set the definitive framework for political and corporate decisions in Germany and worldwide. Only a stable environment can provide the opportunities needed for societies throughout the world to end poverty, create healthy living conditions, promote justice and peace and maintain quality of life and prosperity. Let us foster our dialogue and strive together to make the planetary boundaries concept work. Thank you very much. I wish you all a safe homeward journey or an interesting time to those of you attending the side event, planetary boundaries and financial sector. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much. And thank you to you and all the other organizers for having us uh, for this very rich day and a half. It only remains for me uh, to thank all of you as well. I must say, um, I'm a journalist by background, you may have guessed. Um, I'm not an expert in this or almost, journalists are rarely experts in anything. Uh, but I moderate conferences on many subjects and I didn't know much about planetary boundaries. I'd heard the phrase, I didn't know what it meant until I began my reading to prepare for this event. I found it relatively easy to grasp the concept. Uh, we've talked a lot about how difficult or easy it is. Uh, what I am very struck by from the last day and a half in one sentence is how important it is to address this issue and the urgency of doing so, the importance of working together as we have done in this room, in the working groups, in the breakout groups uh, over the last day and a half. And I'm convinced of one thing. Uh, the Parliamentary State Secretary talked about the opportunities. With the passion and the vision and the expertise that we have heard and shared uh, in this room and in the breakout sessions, I am utterly convinced that you can convince the world to take the action that is necessary to become the stewards of our planet, to go back to what Johan Rockström said. So I wish you all the best in your future endeavors. Practical note lunch will be served outside in the bottom area there where we were yesterday for those of you who are attending the side event on planetary boundaries and the financial sector it starts at two o'clock in here uh, you are very welcome of course if you registered if you didn't register and you would like to stay uh, you would also be welcome to do so but it only remains for me to wish you all uh, a very pleasant rest of the day and a safe journey home whether it's down the road in Berlin or back to another country. Thank you all very much indeed.